All right, hello everyone. My name is John Park, and I'm here to uh, make a short-ish tutorial on how to use SoundCypher. SoundCypher is a MIDI library that we're going to be implementing with processing. So if you have any projects or interests in combining what you've learning, uh, what you're learning in creative coding, but having some sound-based output, um, the sounds coming out of SoundCypher are synthesized sounds very much like uh, you'd get out of a Casio keyboard. Um, this library is not particularly useful for playing back recorded audio such as uh, mp3 files or things that you've recorded on a microphone. Instead they're synthesized sounds um, that simulate instruments. So let's jump in. First of all the the library sound cipher for processing is not built into the processing's repository. Instead, we're going to be going to a Google link up here, or a Google web search, and we can search in sound cipher, C-I-P-H-E-R, and I also usually type in processing. Um, the hit we're looking for is on the website explodingart.com. That's us. We'll go ahead and click on sound cipher. Uh, here is our kind of download page, uh, information about it. So I'm just going to click on download. And here it says download and decompress soundcypher.zip. So I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm just going to save this to the desktop for now. Now this is going to get downloaded as a zip file. Uh, whether you're on a PC or a Mac, we're going to have to go through these steps very carefully. So please uh, don't mess this one up. Uh, first of all, we have to go find the folder where that zip file saved. And so I will move my stuff out of the way. Sorry about my messy desktop, but there we go. There is the zip file. So I'm going to double click to go inside of the zip file. If you're on a PC and you double click, it will open up a window and show you the contents of the zip without actually unzipping or, or uh, ejecting the contents of that zip file out. If you're on a Mac and you double click, it will uh, decompress that file and put this folder sort of on your desktop also. Either way, we need the folder that's inside. So on this PC, I kind of am in the zip. I see that there's a folder called Sound Cipher. I'm gonna right click on that and just say copy. If you're on a Mac, just the the version that ejects out when you double click on the zip file um, that says sound cipher, just right click on that and say copy. Now, this is a processing library. It's actually a Java library that's been kind of wrapped appropriately for processing. Uh, you, whether you're on a PC or a Mac, I need you to go to your documents folder. Okay, this is very specific documents. You're gonna go to your processing folder. So there's processing inside of documents. And then inside of this, if you scroll around, you're probably going to find a folder that says libraries. Okay. In the rare chance that you don't have that folder in there, but you do see documents and processing, you might need to create a new folder called libraries. Uh, notice the spelling, lowercase l, all lowercase, libraries, plural. I'm going to double click on there. Here are the, the processing libraries. I have installed some in the past for, for libraries that I've used, um, but you, yours might be empty if you're newer to processing. Here we're going to right click and just say paste. Okay, it will then send all that, you know, all the appropriate files for the SoundCypher folder and SoundCypher library are now inside of that processing libraries folder. All right, so those are the steps to get it installed. Now, if you have processing open right now, you need to fully quit out of processing, like all of the little windows, quit out of the entire program, and you need to kind of restart processing from scratch, from fresh, because when processing restarts, it's going to scan this folder and look for any additions for new libraries. Okay, so uh, for this, I'm going to be using a fairly recent version of processing. This is processing 4. Point something, 4.0 beta 4. That's fine. If the color of your processing looks different than mine, the interface, don't worry. That's just a theme that you can change now in processing for us, different colors. But, all right, so here we have uh, the initial beginning. Now, whenever you're using a third-party library, you they often will install with some example files and this is a really great way to learn so i'm going to go up to file go down to examples 
Okay, I'll click on examples. This window will pop up that has different examples. By the way, many of these just ship with processing. Basics, topics, demos, and uh, these three, sorry. Basics, topics, and demos. There are folders and folders and folders of examples. So this is an amazing way to learn coding. But contributed libraries will have examples from these third-party libraries that you install yourself. So uh, I'm going to click on the plus for contributed libraries. Um, now, specifically, I've, you know, I had a bunch of these, but the one I'm looking for is Sound Cipher. So there's Sound Cipher there, and these are all, again, different ways to learn how Sound Cipher works. So I'm going to start with one that's called Bing. This is a very simple one. I'll double click on Bing. Okay. Now, what's interesting about the Bing example is there's no void setup and no void draw, which means it's only going to run once, but it just has the absolute bare bones necessity to show you how to play a note. So if I hit the play key, let me turn my volume up a little bit. Okay, I hit the play key here. Okay, you probably heard that single piano sound. That's the default sound. Now, Right off the bat, if you're going to be working from Bing, like I'm going to here, it's really great to make some notes. There are, th or make some notes, make some a comment for yourself by doing two slashes. Um, first of all, this is a single note that plays, play note. This is the pitch, this is the volume, this is the duration. So if I were to change that pitch from 60 to 30, this should be one octave lower. Okay, there's 30. Here's 60. And then if you want to go an octave up, this you just double the number. That'd be 120. Mm, I think. Well, no, <laughs> I take that back. These are uh, not in hertz. I forgot. These are uh, like notes on the piano. So um, I guess then every 12, I think every 12 that we go up will be a an octave up. Let's see if that's true. Here's 60. 72. Yep, another 12 would be 84. There we go. Okay, so imagine a, a keyboard uh, or a piano. There's eight white keys and four black keys, I believe, if my music is working well in my brain. So for that reason, each one of these notes is like playing the next key up in the keyboard, including the black keys. And therefore, if you were to work in sets of 12 for the pitches, it's like going up one octave, you know, like middle C to the next C up to the next C up would be 12 numbers higher and higher. Now, the max range for this is from 0 to 127. So the first number is pitch, 0 being the lowest pitch, 127 being the highest. You probably won't be able to hear anything lower than 10 or 15. You probably won't be able to hear anything higher than 115, 120. Um, those are just like super low and super high. So the most comfortable range I'd say would be between 40 and 120, something like that, or 40 and 100. The second number in here is the volume. Okay, this is the volume. Um, also known as amplitude. Uh, I think in mus musical terms, they also call this dynamic, I think. Um, but 100, I believe this is 100, maybe 100%. Um, I don't normally see this number higher than this. Usually people just go lower if they want a quieter note. Okay, the third number is the duration in seconds. So this piano note is going to be playing for two seconds. I hit play. It has a kind of a nice decay. When you tap it, you hear the sound falls off. It tapers off. If this were five seconds, and we hit play, the decay stretches out quite a bit longer. Okay, And then, of course, the, these, this number has a decimal point, so you can make these very short and staccato if we want. So 0.25, quick little note. Boom. Done. Okay, So... Um, that's another option there. So there we have w just a single note. Now, could you change other things about this? Yes. Before we kind of get in there, we probably want to have some time base, though, because many people write a program to not just play one single note, but have multiples. So let's go ahead and create here a void setup. We'll put in the size. Oops. We'll put in the size of a sketch, uh, in this case, 800 by 600. We'll 
close the curly bracket. Okay, and then after that, let's go ahead and do a void draw. Now these are components of almost every processing sketch. So if you've done code, a little bit of coding and processing, this part should look familiar. Now we need to not run this yet because there's some little problems we have to fix up, mostly surrounding um, just the format of our code. So this kind of play note thing needs to happen somewhere inside of a function. So I'm gonna kind of grab all of this stuff, all select it all, control X will cut it, and I'm just gonna put that in void setup, control V will paste it. So that's happy there. Now this still might not go well because we do always need this import line. Okay, this is gonna be important to always say we're gonna be using SoundCypher's library, so that's always gonna be a global import above void setup. But this thing says SoundCypher SC, okay? Because we're gonna put this in a dynamic sketch, something that has a void setup and a void draw, after the SC, you can just put a semicolon here. I'm going to have you grab everything to the right of that semicolon, like this. We're going to cut that with Control X. And then in void setup, below size, we'll just say SC equals, and then Control V to paste. OK, so whoops, only one equals, there we go, <laughs> SC, and then equals new sound size for this. So what we're essentially saying is, this is a, a library, this is a class called the SoundCypher class. We're calling an instance of that class SC. And then down in void setup, we're saying SC is equal to uh, a new copy, a new version of this SoundCypher sort of library world, if you will. Um, and it's going to affect this sketch that we're working in right now. All right, so if that all feels good, now hit the play button, we really want to make sure we still hear the same note. It should only happen once because it's in void setup. But let's hit play. Bink. OK, good. So you might ask, like, why do we do all that work when nothing really has changed? Well, now we have the kind of setup for something that has um, a visual size, a space in the canvas. It's kind of a bigger canvas. And we have a void draw, which means we have a timeline. So if we want to kind of play a note on, say, a mouse, a mouse click, every time you click, we hear a note, sort of like every time you tap a synthesizer keyboard key, we hear a note. And a good place to do that might be in a void key pressed. Okay, void key pressed. Or, sorry, that would be if you want to hit a keyboard key. If you want it to be a mouse, we could say mouse pressed. Okay, either one could work. You have to set them up slightly differently. But let's say now, just for any time I click on my mouse, that's a right or a left mouse button click, um, that this function fires off. Let's have the note that we kind of were playing with earlier play. So I can select the note from void setup. If you want to bring the comments with it that you copied, that's fine. Select both of those lines. We can say cut. So right click, select cut, and then avoid mouse pressed, paste. Now we're saying don't play that first note to start with in void setup, but every time we do click the mouse, play that one note, pitch 84, 100 volume, 0.25 seconds. Let's, let's see, I've got my sketch, I click. Every time I click. Okay, good. So we've got different notes. All right, excellent. Now, let's have some scenario, right? If you wanted to have changes in pitches in the notes, very often on the keyboard, the left side of the keyboard is the lower notes, right side of the keyboard is the higher notes. So what if we want to do the same thing with our sketch, where if I click on the left side, these are low notes, and right side, these are high notes, OK? We know that we have something, or you might know, <laughs> that we have something called mouse X in processing. Mouse X will give us the X position of our mouse anywhere between zero, the kind of starting point is the top left of your mouse. So zero and mouse X is here, all the way over to the width of your sketch. However many pixels you've set this to be wide, I set mine to 800. So my mouse X would be more like 800 if it was over here. So if I wanted to kind of rescale my mouse's positions from here to here to the piano notes, which I mentioned before could go between 0 and 127, we can do that. Okay. So let's do this. 
we're going to add a new line in void mouse pressed. We're going to say, let's make a new integer, just a new whole number, and let's call this note. Is that safe to do? Yes. That looks fine. Int note. That means making a whole number. And I'm going to say equals. Now here what we're going to do is we're going to use a fancy little function called map. Map will kind of rescale one range of numbers for you and make it a different range. So when you use map like this, we want to say what is the number we're going to be rescaling? And my answer is mouse capital X, because that's the thing that's going to be changing is as I move my mouse around. So we'll put a comma there. The first two numbers after this are what is the smallest number mouse x can be, and what is the biggest number? So zero is the smallest, comma. The width of the sketch is the largest. By the way, width here is always the same thing as the first number you put in size. Okay, this is, so in my case, width is 800. I'm gonna not put 800 here though, in case later on I change the size of my sketch to be 1200 pixels, then this will then automatically update and become 1200, which is good. So this is the native range minimum and maximum of mouse x. Now it says, OK, what is the, the new minimum and the new maximum that you want to squish or scale or remap your mouse x to? And I mentioned before that the pitch can go from 0 to 127. But you know, 0 is so low that it's not very useful. 127 is so high it's not very useful that I want to kind of put in a useful minimum and a maximum range. So I'll say 12 as my minimum note my lowest note, and 110 as my highest note. Okay, and I put a semicolon there. All right, so this map function is properly written. It's, it's That's a, a legit way to do it. I am getting this little error message that's saying, ooh, not good, something's wrong. This is like autocorrect on Microsoft Word. It's telling us that something's off. It gives us a little hint at the bottom. It says, type mismatch, float does not match with int. If you're new to coding, that might sound mysterious and strange, but map is doing algebra for us. It's essentially squishing a number range into a new number range, and it's doing that in, in a way that's giving us decimal-based numbers. So um, depending on what mouse x is, the new range of numbers might be giving us 12.3 or 86.4, whereas we're telling the program that this uh, variable called note is going to be an integer or a whole number. So if you ever see this message, it's not a, a very really bad one. It's just saying, we want a whole number here, and you're giving us a decimal-based number, or what's also called a float. In essence, all we have to do is take the right side of this and round it down to become a whole number. So then if the thing in yellow was 87.5, it would get rounded down to 87, and the program would be happy because it'd say, oh yeah, 87 is now a whole number or an integer, so we're good to go. So quick way to round stuff down in processing is before your number, right? this is like this whole thing in yellow will become a number. So before all of that, we can say int, open a parentheses, and then at the very end of it, just close the parentheses. Okay. All right. So now this thing was the floated float based number or decimal based number. It got rounded down because of this int and its closing parentheses. All right. Now over here, this is kind of a less dangerous error. It says you made this thing called note, but you're not using it anywhere. So now is our it's just a reminder. We need to actually use it somewhere. So now we're going to put note instead of the pitch in play note. So I'll say use that variable note. OK, so let's run it, see if this makes sense. OK, our program's here. I click in the middle. OK, I go to the right. It's only happening on mouse press. Now, if that seems a little confusing, like, mm, nope, don't get it. I don't know why that, that's happening. One more explanation of this, OK? Every time we click on the mouse, a, a note is playing. We're saying sound cipher dot play note. So tap some note on the keyboard. We always have to put in three numbers, the pitch, the volume, and the duration. So the volume and the duration are fixed. They're always going to be the same, 100% volume, a quarter of a second for the duration. 
But this thing called note here is the pitch, the varying low to high part of the note. So before we even play that note, we're making a new variable here. It's an integer or a whole number, and it's called note. That integer is a rounded down, so int is going to round it down, little piece of math that's going to remap your mouse's x position. And your mouse's x position would normally be between 0 and 800, in my case, it's the, or the width of the sketch. And if it used to be 0 to 800, it's going to stretch. What used to be 0 now becomes 12. And what used to be 800 now becomes 110. And it's going to kind of essentially squash that big range of 800 numbers down to be, be, to be roughly 100 numbers. Another way to look at this is roughly every 8 pixels that I move my mouse x to the right will play one note higher. It's kind of like dividing mouse x by 8. It's very close to that but it's doing it in a more precise way. Um, and so the math of all of this work here is going to give us a number between 12 and 110, depending on where your mouse is located on the x-axis, left to right. So there we have sc.playnote. OK, so hopefully that's kind of useful. Um, that's remapping your mouse's exposition to the pitch. Now let's get into a couple of the little details that are sort of helpful. How do we change instruments? The default instrument is a piano. Um, in void setup, or you can really do this anywhere, but we have sc.instrument. Okay, instrument. And we have 127 different instruments to play with. Default is zero. Um, the first set of four or five instruments I think are pianos. If I were to do a bigger number like 12, Okay, and we close the parentheses. This there's like essentially a lookup table or a list of codes that um, change what these notes sound like, whether it sounds like a guitar or a harpsichord or a flute or a voice and so on. So let's just see what 12 sounds like. Ooh. Okay, this sounds like a xylophone. Not bad. Okay, let's choose a different one, 36. Different sounds. Maybe it's your jam. I don't know. Uh, let's do one more. 77. OK. Sounds like part of a Phil Collins song from the 80s. OK. So a lot of these um, sounds are, again, synthesized, meaning they're kind of created from scratch through algorithms and through what are called oscillators. It's creating the approximation of a real instrument. Um, through math, essentially, which is neat. OK, so you might ask, OK, yes, you can change instruments. How do I know what instrument is what? Um, there are some MIDI um, instrument tables. Let's see if we can find one that will probably be close to what we're kind of going for. So this very, if I look up MIDI instrument table, GM1 sound set, let's just see what these look like. Um, this might track fairly well with your instruments. Um, so for example, it says, oh, pipes, strings. Theoretically, the strings are somewhere in the 40s. So let's see if I change my instrument to be like 44, if I hear something that sounds like a string instrument. And a lot of string instruments sound a little bit better if the duration is longer. So instead of my duration of my notes being a quarter of the second, I'll do 1.5 seconds. And let's see if this works. Maybe. Kind of stringish, I guess. Um, some of them towards the end get really odd. Um, sound effects at the very end are like wacky. Uh, let's try some percussion real quick. Let's say 117 in between 113 and 120. Let's do 117 as my instrument. We're, li we're listening for drums, percussion. Yes, totally working, very percussive. OK, so this lookup table is not a bad kind of start starting place if you're kind of seeking some specific instruments. Um, so this is a starting point. 
to get into single note plays that you're manually triggering. You might have different reasons or ways or, I don't know, uh, maybe a data set that you're working with will trigger off like an if statement. If this certain thing happens, boom, play a note. Or if you are working with an Arduino and, and doing stuff, um, changing knobs or dials, you might say, hey, I'm going to send this signal here if I physically touch this dial and we're going to change the pitch of those notes. Um, you could also map anything to the volume or map it to the uh, duration. Okay, so you don't you're not stuck with only changing pitch. It's just one of the more dramatic things to change. Just so you know, under file examples, there are some other really useful ones to point out. Um, specifically, if I kind of go down, um, we've got, uh oh, sneeze coming. No, we're good. <laughs> we have something called play play a chord. If you wanted to, if you're interested in chords. Um, this is how chords work. This specific chord, just like the other example, has no timeline. So you're going to hit play and it'll play once. Let's go ahead and do this. OK, piano chord. Um, check out what this is doing. This is saying we're going to make an array of pitches. Remember, an array is going to be a numbered list. And for every number here, it's a different pitch, so a different note on the keyboard. Um, 60, 64, 67, and 71. We can also mention that there are four of these numbers. So this is like hitting down on the keyboard with four fingers. If I were to pull out one of these notes and then run this, it'll be just like hitting it with three fingers instead. OK, of course, two would only be two notes, Oops, which should probably sound even worse. OK, so that's just two notes. Um, as you all know, if you're a pianist, some notes sound better than others. So if I were to kind of put in the wrong numbers here, it probably would sound kind of bad, like 62 and 63. This probably will sound yucky. Ooh, discordant. Bad, bad news. So um, these numbers really do matter. So this is how you make a chord. But when it says, instead of play note before, it's saying play chord. And by using this array that's essentially a list of notes, it's saying play all three of those, or all four of those, or as many as you have in the list. So you could definitely implement sc.playchord into your code here if you wanted, right? Instead of sc.playnote, I could say sc.playchord. It's going to say play chord is expecting a, an array of notes instead of a single note. And so I probably would have to say float, open, close square bracket, and um, let's say, let's call this one pitches two. It doesn't have to have that name, but I'll do that. And inside of these curly braces are going to be one, two, three, four, five, as many different numeric notes as we want. Okay. So for now, to say, you know, um, 34, 38, um, 52, and 58. Okay, so four different notes. And pitches, I'm going to put that word pitches into my play chord instead of note. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. When I click, oh, they're all, they're all percussions. Let me change my instrument to 55. Maybe that's better. Wow. Oh my gosh. That sounds like a horror movie. I actually kind of, I really like that. Not bad, guys. Uh, but still, it's not very musical. So let's go to 22, different instrument. Holy God. Okay, there we go. So not the best numbers, but there's four um, notes that are playing in a chord. Um, if, this, if we want a piano, I think we can just go back to instrument zero. Okay. So those are always playing the same four notes. Is it possible? Is it? Is there some way to have these pitches sort of also be affected by my mouse note, the thing that we mapped earlier? Sure, you could always use a note, especially if we change note to a float. <laughs> if we change note to a float, um, then we can use note instead of one of these fixed numbers. So instead of 34, let me say note. And in fact, if we want to get really tricky, what if the second note is note, which is a number, plus 
five. Okay, that's five keys up on the keyboard. So two of these notes are going to be affected by where my mouse X position is when I click. The other two will always be fixed at keys 52 and 58. So let's play. Here we go, ready? Okay, so that's what how chords work. It really requires its own array. Good to know about. Um, the one more really useful one I want to throw your way is we have something called um, play a phrase. Now a phrase is like a list of multiple notes. This is very neat. This is going to play a sequence of notes. You know, imagine Mary had a little lamb, right? Each of those pitches have their own duration and in this case their own dynamics or volume. So this is going to be a one-time play of these notes at these volumes. Each of these are going to correspond. So the first note is going to have a volume of 80% and be half a second long. The second note will be 100% volume and one second long. So let's hit play. OK, boom, 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 boom. There we go. And if that exact same sketch, which I just blew up, let me bring it back. If that same sketch, if we were just to change just the pitches, you can probably guess we would hear different notes. So I'm going to break this fairly decent song and um, really make you all mad at me. But that's OK. You can handle it. Oh, yeah. Arbitrary, pretty terrible numbers here. Okay. So this will, I promise you, sound worse. Here are my pitches. Now, you do have to have the same number of, the same length of these three arrays. Essentially, if this one has eight numbers, eight different values in there, then you have to have eight values for dynamics or the volume and eight values for the durations. Or else it won't know what to do. We hit play. Wow. Now that's a non-musician's phrase right there. So um, here they all are in pitches, dynamics, and durations. Um, can these all? Can one of these be fixed instead of, a, of a, an array? Like, could all the volumes, or what they call dynamics, all be set to 75%? Um, the answer is no. <laughs> Play phrase wants them all to be an array of the same length. OK, so we'll keep that in mind, too. So hopefully this gets you going with sound cipher and processing. Enjoy your, your synthesizing of music. And uh, yeah, good luck coding. Thanks.